All right. So Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 12, working through 18. We may or may not get all the way through 18 today, um, but we'll, we'll try. All right. So verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's a, a, a rough verse. So when you look at the scriptures, whenever you come to therefore, what's the first thing you should do? Look at the verse before, right? Uh, because he just made was making some points. And then he says, therefore, and so, so we want to look at what he was just saying prior to that. Yeah, and that Paul even had to go back on the channel. <laughs> <laughs> so he was just talking about, in the section right prior to that, he was just talking about the example of Christ, right? So, and then he said, and all how Christ obeyed and um, obeyed God and became a servant. Um, and so, I was just speaking about that and verse 12 he says therefore so therefore and he was just urging them to live in a to walk in a manner worthy of the calling they have been called and then use the, it as an example of that and then says therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed now so now not only as in my presence but more much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering, Upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. All right, so verse by verse here. Well, let's look at verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my absence, but much more in my uh, my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So a few things you want to notice as we move forward here. Paul here begins to apply the reasoning for his powerful poetic language on the character, personhood, and reward of Christ. Uh, so he's applying it here. Though Paul does not teach on who Jesus is in this portion we're going to examine, ex examine um, as Nate stated last week, it's not solely for theological education, um, what, what Paul stated about Jesus and what he did. Um, uh, Paul is reminding the Philippians of the example here they are to follow in Christ. And so he points that out. He spends a lot of time saying how, how just pointing to you the example of, of who Jesus was and what he did. So you need to understand to note Paul's affectionate tone here and encouraging tone, even though these are some scary words. <laughs> he's being very encouraging. He's talking about how they've already been obeying. Um, he's not saying, will you just obey? <laughs> they've already been obeying. All right, they've already been uh, doing it right, and Paul is acknowledging that. All right, so and encouraging more. So this whole letter is more of a letter designed to help the church avoid the pitfalls pitfalls of sin, rather than to correct those who have already fallen into sin. All right, he sees certain things coming, and he's trying to address them before they be, begin to go even further. All right, but in general, it tends to be, it's not Corinthians, right? This is not First Corinthians, this is not Galatians, it's vastly different tone. Um, so Paul begins his exhortation here again by calling them beloved, right? Acknowledging their faithfulness in his presence and in his absence. And then we come to Paul's exhortation, which can be problematic for many people. And actually, probably it should cause every Christian to pause when we read it, all right? And says, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Mm -hmm. All right. So that word work in the Greek is, this is how I, this is how I pronounce my, look at how I, I pronounce, pronounce this. Phrase. No. I divided it up into cat, hair, gaz, and oh my. 
So <laughs> it's Kefir Gazelai. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, and that can be understood as to, it's even, an even scarier word than works, all right? Because it in the Greek, it means it's closer to work, to work out or to bring about or to achieve, all right? So work out your own salvation sounds like earning, and that's actually in the language. Um, so we ought to be wondering right away, well, what does Paul mean by this? What does Paul mean? Um, so when we come to a confusing part of scripture that seems to contradict other, other theological teachings in scripture, what do we do? Hmm? Compare others. References, yeah. And uh, so where, where is a good place to, where do we check in any, when, in, any, in any passage we're reading, where do we check to get, make sure we're getting the right meaning? The first place is where? Context. The surrounding context. Uh, the second place is 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 further surrounding context, right? The the whole book. But the third place is what? Other writings that first mentioned. Other writings of the same of the same author. All right. So first surrounding surrounding paragraphs. Second theme of the whole book. Third is other writings by the same author. So if we're if we come to this and we think that well, Paul is teaching works based salvation here, then we need to ask. You know, is is that what Paul teaches everywhere? You know, um, and we know the answer is no. All right, so we're going to take a look at some scriptures that might clarify that this is not what Paul is really saying here, um, and it might give us a clue to what he is saying. All right, so let's turn to Ephesians chapter two, verse one through eight. We want to read it. The, the main the main word we're looking at here is verse eight. The main, the main verse in Ephesians two is verse eight. But again, we want to stay in context, so we're going to start from verse one of chapter two. And you were dead in your in the trespasses and sins in which you walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, loved, I'm sorry, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him, with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. But kind of neat. Let's look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. All right. Uh, I didn't consider verse 10 until I started really digging into Ephesians a little bit more to, to come to this point. But verse 10 is just neat, and you'll see why in a minute, in a minute here, I think. Um, so <clears throat> many people mistakenly just read in verse 8 that Paul is saying that faith is the gift of God. Um, I want to tell you that, yes, faith is the gift of God. But this passage in Ephesians 2 I think it's a mistake to read that Paul is teaching that faith is the gift. Um, rather, what's going on there is Paul is talking about salvation, right? All of salvation is the gift. Faith is a gift, but so is your next breath. So is so is your capacity for for thinking, moving, existing. All of it is a gift, and and really, I believe it's my opinion that Paul uh, is really talking about all of salvation. In Ephesians 2 there. He's not speaking of what we were, and he is speaking, I'm sorry, he's speaking of what we were and what God has made us and is making us. And none of it, none of it, not faith, not grace, um, is our doing, all right? You have been saved by faith, uh, through, by grace through faith, and this is not of your own doing. 
right? It's one whole sentence. It's a whole idea that your salvation is not your idea. It's not your work. And uh, um, so uh, to, to kind of back that up a little bit, if we look at Romans 6.23, we read, we read, for the wages of sin is death. This is by Paul again. And the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The gift of God is eternal life, salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so if the gift of God is salvation, we are saved by grace through faith, all of which is a gift and not by works, right? And so that needs to come into our understanding and reading of Philippians 2.12. If, if Paul is spending this time in Ephesians and in Romans talking about how salvation is a gift of God to us, how he has paid the price, then how can he say, work out your salvation, all right? Work out your own salvation. And why don't you read us the, the Greek, the literal meaning of that word, kata. I already forgot how to say it. Kat here, gazoma. <laughs> uh, to accomplish, implying something done with thoroughness. Mm -hmm. that, I like that second primary. part. Primary. Yeah. I like that second part. That relates really well. To accomplish, say it, read that again. Uh, to accomplish, implying something done with thoroughness. Done with thoroughness. That's really good. Um, so some have argued that Paul is speaking of the Philippian church corporately here and not of individual salvation, right? So that's how some people get around this idea of working out your salvation. That it's not talking about earning individual salvation. It's talking about the church. So Paul speaking to the church corporately, work out your salvation, earn it, achieve it, be thorough, um, corporately. All right. You've already been saved as individuals, now work it out as a, as a, as a group. And so that's how some, some commentators get around it. Silva and the Baker commentator, commentator, commentary, um, which is excellent. Um, and if you have an opportunity to, to buy the Baker commentaries, I would, I would suggest them. They're very good. But in the Baker commentary, he applies to that idea of corporate salvation with this. This rendering is, of course, quite possible. One must ask, however, it, uh, it is that, however, okay, here we go. One must ask, however, how it is that God works in the midst of people is not through personal transformation. To state that the passage refers not to individual salvation, but to the church's well-being already assumes a conceptual dichotomy that is both false and lethal. As we noted in connection with 119 and 27, personal sanctification, sanctification takes place precisely in the context of the Christian community. So we immediately, in our struggle with this verse, uh, one of our errors that we make when we come to the Word of God, we carry a lot of theological bag baggage and bias, even scholars do, and we try to understand troublesome verses like this in a way that harmonizes with our preferred beliefs. But I want to encourage you, whenever you read the Word, don't be afraid to ask the question, well, what if I, what if I have been believing wrong? All right. What if I've been believing wrong? The job of the Holy Spirit is to guide us into all truth, to conform us, to conform you, to conform me to the truth. Um, we, we don't conform the Holy Spirit. We don't conform the word to us. The Holy Spirit is to conform us to the truth. All right. Um, so in order for that to happen, uh, you need to be made uncomfortable sometimes. And this is one of those verses that can make you feel uncomfortable. Does it work out your salvation? You're like, well, if it's left up to me, it's never going to happen. You know? Um, and so you need to, and it, it's okay. So if, if you're struggling with it and you're like, how, well, how does that mean? How am I supposed to achieve it? It's okay. So a couple, I, I'm talking about this a lot for a couple of reasons. One, because uh, I don't want to undersell what Paul is saying here. Two, because I want to understand it. In, well, three reasons. Uh, I want to understand it in the context of Pauline writing. And and three, because, you know, it's okay to be concerned when you come across a verse that doesn't seem to make sense, all right, and to, and to really struggle with it. You know, it's um, we're talking here about a God that is eternal. Um, and there's going to be times when your, your personal idea of faith or the one that you've, that's been handed down to you if you're an honest reading of the reader or the word, sometimes it's going to be difficult. All right. And you need to be willing to be uncomfortable 
All right. Um, one sec. Um, so uh, we also need to recognize that our, that our part of the problem with this verse may be our concept of salvation. Right. Um, so remember who is speaking. Remember that Paul was radically changed by his encounter with God. Paul did not work out that initial encounter. And yet Paul presses on. I'll take, I'll take comments in just a second. Yeah. So biblical salvation is not simply the initial birth of new life. And so this is my point here. When Paul says work out your salvation, remember Paul's understanding of salvation is more accurate than ours. All right. Um, and so we tend to think of salvation as something that's one and done. But that's not actually the biblical understanding of salvation. Uh, salvation begins with a new birth. All right. But it goes on into eternity. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. All right? Go ahead, Jeff. Well, I just wanted to just offer that you have, have encouraged us, you did it again in this class uh, today. Uh, when we run across a, a verse, we want to understand, to look at the content, and, and expand that content of the verse. Yeah. And you can see uh, throughout all of the New Testament writings, I don't know if every author mentions or many, this concept. Mm -hmm. James talks mm -hmm. about faith. James, for word. sure. Is dead. Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. That's agony. You, you've got to actually do something to work out your salvation. Yeah. yeah. You've got to follow and go where he's leading. Yeah. You know. It's, it's not to sit here and get out of hell free. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. The the it's the idea that it's free grace is true, right? But it's free grace that costs you everything. <laughs> How do you transform? Yeah, yeah. If yeah. you don't change. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't always come in exactly the same way to people when they're studying and working. They might have a sudden feeling that inspires their faith and might may, may find it out when they're talking with someone. Mm. It's not always going to be identical. Yeah. I look at the work, uh, work out. Mm -hmm. So when we are born again, we, it, it's the, um, we need to be mature. And then I, I think it is it's first Peter, like we we drink the milk starting. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like our physical body. Mm -hmm. We need to work it out. It's, it's not that we, I mean, just look at it, that's it. Uh, but we need to be matured in Christ. So we, we have to actually, God will allow challenges that are beyond mm -hmm. What we can do, especially sometimes I look at it. I mean, I'm That's good. 69 years old already, and then this the weakness in our body. Let us think about that. So many things that is beyond us we can do. So the the old age, the challenges, the the pain, you know, should draw us close to God, mm -hmm. and then because it beyond what we can do. And by facing these challenges without, I mean, grumbling and, and dispute, help us to, to, to be able to, to connect to God and by more interaction with God, our spiritual life, the, the, the born again life will, will grow up. And so that when we come to see God, we won't be strangers to him. Yeah. And then we'll be more like Jesus mm -hmm. than like the son. So, and, and then he said that this is from God. Mm -hmm. And and so it, it, it the will and the work of good pressure so that we can mature. And it is, like you said that, I mean, I make a tons of excuse not to do all these things. Mm -hmm. but, but then, we recognize that this is from God. Mm -hmm. Not just, I mean, sometimes we, we the challenges coming into our life, we, we may not be able to see it, 
we, we want to use the worldly way to, to deal with all these challenges. But now we recognize that it is from God. Yeah. Just the command, God's just because we believe in his goodness. So even though we, it is beyond what we can do, but we continue to work it out like our body. We need the physical exercise. Mm -hmm. And then you come to him and then they will build up. And the, the trembling and, 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 uh, and the fear is that it is not fear about that we're going to lose the salvation, mm -hmm. but fear that we will fall into the sin mm -hmm. and hurt the, our relationship with God and also our relationship with our fe fellow believer also. I yep. think that's one, one way to look at that. Yeah. So there's, there's, we're running low on time here. So there's another, I would just want to encourage you to check out the Silva commentary. It's excellent. And uh, he talks about more, more about uh, this verse here um, than we can go over, but it's just, just excellent. And so we're going to move on to the with fear and trembling. And um, so if workout was not, as Peter mentioned, if workout is, was not troublesome enough, um, Paul then goes on to say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I, I want to, uh, what I'm going to say about this, again, may seem a little overwhelming, but I want to encourage you to stick with me um, and uh, until we reach 13. And, uh, and then, uh, so just hold your objections until the end. <laughs> there might be some objections. Um, so we, gotta, we have to ask the question, why would Paul mention fear and trembling? And we don't really think of our relationship with God in that way. Um, I know there are some people in our church that have that no, I no longer part of a part of our congregation, and, and they had a real problem with the idea of fearing God. Um, they didn't like that idea at all. Um, but in actuality, fear and both fear and trembling are very biblical concepts. And so, let, let me give us some examples uh, from Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, Paul speaks of his own attitude when he came to the Corinthians. And he says, and when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming you to the, the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, but that I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And then again in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, which is really kind of wonderful if you think about it, because Paul started going, he started his ministry with the Corinthians with fear and trembling and just um, this real deep desire in his bones to, to give them the true and true gospel of Christ, you know, um, and and just considering that so heavily that that's what he, he was in fear and trembling with them. And then we read in, and we all know that Corinthians, the Corinthian church was, had a lot of issues, right? Um, but then in, in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 14 through 15, we see that the Corinthian church has matured through their difficulties and Paul's correction of them and Paul, uh, and then Paul, to their difficulties and Paul's correction of them. And Paul says this about their reception of Titus. He says, and besides our own comfort, we rejoiced still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. By the, Paul, Paul would never have said that about uh, any visit to the Corinthian church, but God has been at work. And so in verse 14, for whatever boast I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to you is true, so also our boasting uh, before Titus has proved true. And his affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. So, some modern examples of fear and trembling that I think relate to what Paul's idea here is. Um, I have adopted Isaac as, uh, we have adopted Isaac as our son. And, uh, so what if I were to say to Isaac, Isaac, I want you to work out to live out your adoption. What would I mean by that? Would I mean, you better earn it, kid, or it's going to get taken? <laughs> no. 
Um, it's, it's, it, I would mean I want him to live it out, to be a, in a, to be a Torres in everything he says and does, right? To represent what we stand for, to carry on the mission of our family. Families often say things like that to their kids, adopted or otherwise, represent us well. That's a lot of pressure to put on any child. Represent your family and everything you say and do and think that would cause a child to, that took it seriously in every moment to have a measure of fear, right? Um, I was afraid of my mother uh, with good reason. <laughs> uh, I remember this is a legally blind lady and uh, we have furniture all over the house, right? And uh, I remember her yelling at me from across like two rooms and I called her the B word underneath my breath in a whisper, forgetting that it's because she can't see well, she yeah. hears <laughs> <laughs> like super hearing. And I, and I called her that and <laughs> before I could blink, whap across the face, <laughs> made it through that, that maze of furniture and just wham, legally blind, smack, man. <laughs> never, never said something like that again. And so I had a measure of fear um, that was perfectly appropriate. And I deserved that. Oh, yeah. really? I was a teenager, like 15, 16. Be Christ, like right before Christ. So she had to get on a ladder. She knocked, <laughs> she knocked me into the... <laughs> but anyway, um, so this is what I'm, I'm talking about. That's fear. Another example I thought of... Uh, was one of the last scenes in the movie of uh, Saving Private Ryan. I, I don't like that movie. I don't recommend the movie. It's very gory and upsetting. And um, I saw the film once and I'll never see it again. It's far too graphic and violent and upsetting. Uh, but there was this one scene, if I remember properly, uh, when the Germans are defeated and Ryan is safe and the captain dying says to Ryan, after so many lives have been, been spent to save him, he says, the captain says to Ryan, earn this. He says, earn this, because uh, Ryan was a final uh, son of a mother who had lost like three brothers already. And so the special order went to save him and his, his whole squad died protecting him, beating him safe. And so Captain says, earn this. In the closing scene, we see an older Ryan carrying, crying over the grave of the captain saying how he tried his whole life to live well, to earn it. Um, so the captain said, earn this, but the price had already been paid. All right. Um, lives were already given. Ryan could not earn what he had been given. He tried, he worked, but it had already been given. Um, so while these examples are not a perfect description of what Paul is saying here, it helps us to understand a bit more what he means by fear and trembling. Um, if we consider a price paid for us, the life of the Son of God, the life more precious than all other life, the one from whom life came, has given that life to us, I think we begin to understand the appropriateness of the words with fear and trembling. This may feel overwhelming, and overwhelming is a totally appropriate feeling. In fact, feeling overwhelmed is more appropriate than a casual, oh, well, attitude about faith. So we love to comfort ourselves. We love to comfort ourselves right out of conviction. But God, especially, I want to, not to be mean, but especially in our church, we're a very comforting church. We're a healing church. And, and we love to comfort ourselves right out of conviction. Um, but we need to recognize that uh, before we go further, though, we need to understand that Paul's not meaning to paralyze his readers with fear and trembling. He's just wanting to be so afraid they can't do nothing. All right. Um, Fear and trembling are very biblical words, as, and, and we've been reading, we've been doing, doing a sermon series through Mark, and we've seen a couple times when there's been terrified people in response to what Christ has done. Can you give me a couple of examples? Yeah, they see him, they're like, ah. <laughs> yeah, they're terrified what Christ has done. What else? He walked on the water, scared. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. They were terrified, and uh, the woman at the, with the twelve years, twelve years uh, affliction, when she was cured, she was terrified. All right. Um, 
So uh, God is not, I just want to say that, you know, God is not like us. He is, he is other. He is God. And often our under, our Christian understanding of that is as father, as this Lord who loves us can kind of get away from the actual fact of who he really is. All right. Um, fear is an appropriate response to God. God is not Santa Claus. And as much as we'd like him to be, God is not Mr. Rogers. Right. To view him as such is not biblical. Uh, so the examples of representing family and private Ryan are serious enough. But in verse 5 through 11, we have an entirely different example we are to strive and measure up to. So Paul had just finished saying, look at who Christ is. Look at what he did. Follow this example. Wait, what? So fear and trembling are perfectly appropriate. God is all powerful. Just a side note, sometimes I think what makes us revolt against fear and trembling is actually a lack of belief. It's a lack of belief. Um, if we really believed, we would, in many cases, act differently. We would think about things like God's holiness and righteousness and our desperate state without him, the salvation he offers in Christ to the lost. If we really believed in those things, a lot of how the church would act would be radically different. Radically different. And we see a lot of people, uh, you know, even, even just the church attendance is, is, is one thing that pops in my mind as far as this difference. Um, that we, we think of churches like, if I can fit it in, in my schedule, then, then I'll make an attendance to obey God and, and uh, or make an attempt to obey God and attend. But, you know, not if it, not if it's difficult, you know, our parents weren't like that. You know, you go to church is just what you do as a family. So what do we do? So it was, it was still not the right motivation, but. Let me ask you this. If, if we, if you got a letter in the mail from President Biden, whether you like him or not, right? Um, but a letter in the mail addressed, addressed to you, written to you by him, by hand saying, I want to talk to you at this place and this time. Please meet me here then. Would you show up? You, of course you would. And here God is calling us to have a daily time with him, to worship him corporately. And we tend to just be like, oh, well, I can just do it, whatever. We give God less respect than we give president in many ways. So I see hands, but let me finish. Let me finish. I thought we we're going to get derailed if we don't. Um, um, so our belief if it's proper, is going to reflect what we see in Scripture. And what we see in Scripture is, is a level of seriousness that is not what we see in today's modern Christianity, unfortunately, very often. All right. So Paul could exhort fear and trembling because his entire view of reality was altered. It was different. And so here Paul is encouraging Philippians to work out their salvation, to live out their salvation, to press on with everything that you are and all that you have within you, to work it out with the appropriate fear and trembling, take it seriously, work it out. And so we can only rightly fulfill Paul's command when we are yoked together in Christ. Um, so we're, this is where I'm going to get to the comfort part. So before I get to the comfort part, you can, you can join in with your comments. So Jeff was first and then Dan was second. Well, I just wanted to offer a practical thought here because uh, the previous church, the pastor uh, preached on something called the dangerous prayer. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, at this, I'm not looking at the hand, but how many of us have actually asked the Lord and said, use me, mm -hmm. however you want. That is a scary However, that, that second part is the... That's the point. Oh, yeah. That's a scary <laughs> prayer. <laughs> Yeah, and that's hard to do because he might ask me to do something that I don't particularly want to do. Yeah. You know, that that's fear. However you want. And isn't that the isn't that the essential 
living out act of being a living sacrifice. Well, surrender. That you're not you're not your own. Go ahead. I, you know, I think I grew up in church, and the attitude I am finding now at a more advanced age um, of the church is that. Um, He's our buddy, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know he's we sing what a friend we have in Jesus, which we do. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm only now beginning to. It, it's like, well, wait a minute. If you believe actually that when you look at the stars, there is an eternal being that was before the stars. And will be after the mm -hmm. stars, and that breathe and said the words, mm -hmm. let there be stars, and there they are. And <laughs> man gets all excited that we get another um, telescope that can go like this far and take all these wild pictures. Mm -hmm. And yet, I am beginning to feel really uncomfortable thinking of Jesus as the face of God on the earth is being my buddy. Mm -hmm. He's not my buddy. Mm -hmm. He's someone that I need to be on my knees and be grateful for the fact that his mind turned toward me while I was still mm -hmm. being formed and, and said I will shape your mind mm -hmm. and your spirit so that if you surrender, you, you become one of mine, belong to me. And it just kind of is freaking me out lately um, that I have been so flippant all these years <laughs> that, yeah, I go to church because, yeah, it's I come from the Southern culture and go to church and, you know, and you go and be wild on Saturday night and then everybody shows up at Sunday school the next morning and it, it's different than that and it lately I have felt God almost wooing me to say how about if you just come and worship me and don't worry about what somebody else is doing or what songs we're singing or what's going on and give up your wild Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know Effie's been talking to me about that too. So. Um, and just worship me mm -hmm. and forget all the rest of it. Just worship me. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if not uh, fear and trembling is appropriate because we understand it. Uh, discipline is no problem. Sure, of course, that's part of it. So, yeah. And, and for God, and we need to yeah. understand and we, that as well. Yes, and I mean that's I think that's all part of it. Everything we're talking about is part of it. And Paul, Paul certainly like he felt it right. He 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 was fearful and trembling because what was Paul's main concern in life? For him to live as Christ and to die as gain. Paul, and it's the same thing. Every pastor, when you get up to preach, you're like, if you really understand what you're doing. And even what we're doing right here is we're talking about the word of God. This is God's word. I don't want to misrepresent him. You know, that is fearful and, and to the level of paralyzation, really. And so here's what Jesus says. Come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. So, is Jesus speaking about the kind of rest that we think about when we talk about rest? He's like, oh, okay, I'm done now. I think he's talking about the kind of peace that comes in Philippians here, where Paul talks about in chapter 4. When you're praying to him, you thanksgiving, and you're not anxious about it. Yeah. But that peace that comes from that. And isn't that funny that in the same book that he is he's exhorting fear and trembling, he says, do not be anxious about anything. And so Peter, I mean Peter, um 
Jesus, don't confuse the two. <laughs> Jesus uh, is saying here um, that like the rest that you that he has to give you is at his side. It's yoked together with him. And what was the were, were oxen in a restful state when they were yoked? No, they were working. But if they were working together, they were working together. Especially the young one brought into mm -hmm. the yoke, and the old one there to lead him and show exactly. Him. And and so Jesus is taking that 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 older mentor guiding role and saying, "Yoke with me," and and you're gonna find rest. Do what I do. Do it with me, man. Amen. Um, so, which brings us back to what Paul says about working. Uh, verse 13, which is wonderful here. Look at what Paul is doing here. It says, and what the Lord is inspiring Paul to write. It says, verse 13, for it is God who works in you. <laughs> it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So look at that first word, for. So why would work out your own, uh, why work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? Because God is at work in you. And so sometimes we get so wrapped up in our theological arguments that we almost see work as a bad thing. That's not how the ancient church understood salvation and the work of God and the believer. And we are in the error if we we are in error if we think, well, God is working, so I don't have to. All right. God is working, so I should not attempt to. The apostles' correct understanding is God is at work in you, so work. Take it seriously. Consider every part of who you are and what you do and do not take it lightly. So in our humanness, we can allow these thoughts to lead us into the, these thoughts of what Paul is saying, to lead us into the error of legalism. And that's just as bad. All right. If I, and what I mean by legalism is defining working out salvation as adherence to, uh, to habits and rituals. All right. And say, well, because I this, 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 and this, I've worked out my salvation. Um, and because you don't this, 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 and this, you got well, some work to do, <laughs> you know, um, Christ showed that this definition of God that this does not achieve righteousness. And so it's not enough that we do not commit adultery or murder or steal or lie. That's not enough. God sees everything within us as well. So fear and trembling means we can't hide behind our rules it's not enough to deal with the outward symptom of sin. We have to deal with every unchristlike characteristic in us. God is at work in us does not equate that. And also, here's another thing. God at work in us does not equate God controlling you. All right. We would be in utter error to say that God is the one that causes us to mistreat one another or to sin in any way. Well, God is at work in me. Eh, that's not what that means. All right. God is not acting as puppet master over our lives or our actions. That's not what Paul's talking about. There's a group of believers in the church today that, that do believe this. They're called divine determinists. But there's very little biblical support for that line of thinking. And certainly not what Paul is saying here. Or he would not need to exhort any kind of behavior. All right? He would not need to write anything to, at all to anyone ever. If we're all just puppets on a string, there's no need for any epistle. All right? Um, Paul is referring rather to the fact that God is at the work in the life of the Christian and in the process of their sanctification. God, the Holy Spirit, is empowering, encouraging, exhorting, convicting, rebuking, teaching, comforting, strengthening, guiding, but he is not puppet master. We have to make our own choices and choose to work in him and through him as he is working in us. And to Paul, the very fact that God is at work in us is itself the reason we ought to fear and tremble. No longer our actions are inconsequential. All right. What we do as children of the living God has eternal significance. If, if, if that's not cause to give you fear and trembling, um, just give you a, a quick illustration of this. When I was in, when I was leading youth, I remember Kaylee Sells, not Kaylee Sells, Kimberly Sells would, 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 uh, she she came up to me a couple times that, that over the course of her time in youth and would like complain to me about my habit of apologizing. 
Um, then you said, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Canadian. <laughs> um, Canadians have a, have a, a thing. I'm sorry, it's like, hello. <laughs> Everything, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, we are, uh, uh, when, anyway, continuing on with the illustration, um, I made a habit of apologizing to the teens because I was fearful and trembling. Because I didn't want anything I ever did or said to ever get in the way of the gospel. Um, and so you know, if ever I thought that I might have embarrassed or offended or said something or something was take, that I said was taken out of context or I said it in the wrong tone or whatever, an apology was forthcoming. And it bugged some people. But I explained that to her, that this is the reason why, you know. Um, and I'm sorry it bothers you. <laughs> but, um, so verse 14 uh, through 15, let's read that. Um, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, um, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So these are perhaps verses that are easier to understand than the, the verse that we just got to, the verses that we just covered, all right? Um, but they're not easier to fulfill. <laughs> they might be easier to understand, but they're not easier to fulfill. And Paul says, do, how many things are we to do without grumbling or anything? 13. <laughs> 13 things. All things, all right? Um, all means all. Um, uh so Paul, this word is meant to encompass everything done by the believer. Paul may mean specifically their behavior and actions within the fellowship, but he does not specify that here. And certainly he may have in mind that developing divisions in the church when he talks about grumbling or disputing. But a, a more literal reading of the sentence is do all things without murmurings or disputes. And I like those words better. At least the, in the Greek that I read. <laughs> said murmurings or disputes. And I like those better because murmurings is the word uh, you might want to pronounce that. Take a step with that. <laughs> gangithmos <laughs> is the word gangithmos, and dispute is the word dialogismos. I think I, dialogismos, um, and um, they are similar and related, meaning roughly speaking, negatively about people, about others, and groups behind their backs, like the Pharisee did when Jesus forgave the paralytic. That's what murmuring is. Is is a uh, meaning roughly speaking negatively about others in groups um, like the Pharisees did when Jesus forgave the paralytic sins in Mark 2 and Luke 5. Um, and disputes refers to uh, like open debating and arguing. Um, the Baker commentary says this about those words, the noun uh, gagismos, um, which is murmurings, uh, and the and the verb uh, dialogosmos, dialy, I can't repronounce that, whatever. Um, immediately call to mind the murmuring of the Israelites in the wilderness, uh, which is Exodus 15, 24, 16, 2, 7 through 9, and 12. Any doubts that this is the setting that Paul has in mind are removed when compared to 2.15 with Deuteronomy 32.5, where the Israelites are described as Spotted or stained children, a crooked and perverse generation. And so we'll see how Paul makes that connection further in verse 15. Um, it is more interesting and surely not a coincidence, coincidence that the other passage where Paul uses the experience of the Israelites in the wilderness as an example to motivate Christians' behavior is 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13. That is, when writing to a church plagued by dissension, it may be objected that the murmuring of the Israelites was directed at God. And that the problems in the wilderness are not described in the Bible as consisting of divisions among the people. Yet precisely we may find an important clue to the nature of the Philippians' weakness. Yet here precisely we may find an, an important clue to the nature of the Philippians' weakness. The complaining of the Israelites was indeed directed at God, but in the person of his representative Moses. It is not likely or even inevitable that the... or. Is it not likely or even inevitable that the disputes within the Philippian community involved complaints against their appointed leaders? And would not Paul's clear allusion to the wilderness experience alert 
the Philippians to the possibility possibility that their behavior could be interpreted as a core as quarreling with God. They must remain and these must remain intriguing questions because the letter gives no clear answer. We may, however, point to 229 as a possible hint that the church leaders in Philippi were not being treated with full respect. Um, and we're not going to read 229 right now, but Paul thus encourages the church to do all things without these two behaviors, without murmuring and, and debating or disputing. We need to think seriously about that. As we And as we do, I want to make something clear for us. Our being is before God, our working out of our salvation is always primarily about the me, right? It's not about the other guy's habit of murmuring and disputing. It's about yours. It's about mine. <laughs> Paul is making the connection again in verse 15 to Deuteronomy uh, 32 5, which says, um, this is where this is the verse that he was mentioning, and it says, They have dealt corruptly with me. They are no longer his children because they are blemished, they are a crooked and twisted generation. So Paul is connecting them with what we then what we do with our hearts and, and with our words with blamelessness before God. We need to understand that. He's connecting one what we do with our words and with our hearts with our blamelessness before God. Our words are not just air with sound. All right. They dramatically affect ourselves and the people around us. Jesus said this in Matthew 15, verse 10 to 20. I want you to read this. I encourage you to read this on your own in context. But he says, and he called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand. It is, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Leave them alone. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. And Peter said, explain that parable to us. Explain the parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And that's the files of person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false slander, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. But the eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. And so see also James chapter 3, 1 through 12. Read that on your own. So the implication of Paul's words is that we cannot be without blemish. We cannot shine for God, for the Lord, if we continue grumbling and complaining. Again, this is impossible on our own strength. But it is impossible to do this perfectly. It is impossible to do this perfectly as long as we live in the flesh. But it is not impossible to take this seriously with fear and trembling, as Paul encourages in verse 12. It is not impossible to make it an earnest practice to, to see and understand your life and your choice and words as having eternal significance. And, and if and when you sin against someone, you surrender and you, you surrender to God, and you do what he is calling you to do, to do to make it right. So what Paul is saying here, basically, is get used to apologize. Get used to pointing to the example of Christ in contrast to your own example. Get used to comparing yourself with Christ. Get used to making restitution for when you mess up. Get used to being held accountable. Get used to weighing every encounter with eternal significance. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard Christians, especially those who see themselves as leaders. I've heard of Christians, especially those see, who see themselves as leaders, hurting others with their words and knowing that they have hurt them and not doing anything to make it right or bring healing or confess their own sin. Happens all the time in leadership. We think because we're in leadership that we get to hurt and people need to be all right with that. All right. Certain people in leadership think that. We have to consider all this with fear and trembling. When we speak to anyone, we speak to a person that God cherishes. When we speak to other Christians, we speak to children of the Most High. That ought to make us cautious. That ought to make us take it seriously. We need to shine as lights in the world, Paul says. And we're out of time, but just real quickly wrapping up, 
without spending too much time here, we ought to be reminded of the words of, uh, in, of the Lord in Matthew 5 and John 8 um, and 1 John 1, 17, which all talk about light, right? That you are the light of the world. I am the light of the world. God is light and in him there's no darkness at all, all right? Light is a familiar image to describe who God is. In John 1, 5, God, uh, uh, John 1, 5 says God is, in, is light and there's no darkness in him whatsoever. And so as children of the light, everything about us is to be exposed to that light. And what we give to the world is to be light. What, what Paul's really talking about in this passage, and we don't really have time to go further into it, but what, what he's really talking about here is our responsibility. That's why he, he uses words like fear and trembling. You, when you come to Christ, you represent Christ. When you call yourself a Christian, you represent him to the world. You are an ambassador for Christ to the world. There is no greater call to anyone on this planet than to be an ambassador for the living God. If there's anything we need to take seriously in life, beyond and beyond airline pilot, right? He's got 300 people's lives in his hands. Beyond president of the United States. If there's any calling that we need to take seriously in life as ambassador of Jesus Christ. And that's what we are. In Revelation, we read that we, God has made us a kingdom of priests to serve as God. What do priests do? What's, what's a priest calling to do? To represent God to the people. This is who we are. This is what God has called us to. There's no private faith for the one who's really in Christ. There's none of this, it's mine, it's not yours, I'm going to keep it to me. No. We are called to represent him to the world. In everything we say and do. And so when we hurt one another, when we sin against one another, when we drop the ball and mess up and we're going to, we get to make a choice. We get to say, okay, I'm going to, I didn't represent God here in what I did, but I'm going to represent him in how I make it right. We can either do that or we can say, I messed up and I'm going to hide. I messed up, and I'm going to make it worse by not making it right. See, saying I'm sorry, making restitution, make it. God is so gracious that even in our failure, he can bring victory. Even in our darkness, he can bring light. And he can, he can use those failings and use our, our, our hurting of one another if we surrender to him. If we surrender to him, he can use it. If we are fearful and trembling and want to represent him right in everything we say and do, and beyond ourselves want to, want to give glory to God and realize that it's not about me. If that's our attitude, then even our failings can give him glory if we would give them to him. This is what Paul's talking about. Take every thought, every moment seriously. 